explain how the aspects of God that we take for granted actually disprove him. Normally, this would be impossible, as being non existence is logically flawed. However, the YouTube channel, Nationality Rules, attempts to accomplish this by using the law of non contradiction. It's that contrary propositions cannot exist, or at least both be true in the same sense at the same time. Ignoring the fact that some things in both advanced quantum physics and baseline mathematics violate this law, depending on the system of measurement used in the situation, it's entirely possible that the contradiction is invalid and is, in fact, something different. Ironically, a black and white fallacy that many people use regarding the aspects of God, even the Bible, both of which I've covered already in principle. But I did promise I would do a video on the aspects of God, so I'm going to delve into them here and show how far from disproving his existence, rationality rules has in fact made it easier to accept God and make him bigger and more wonderful than we can feasibly understand. Now, before any of you in the comments start saying you're beating this horse quite severely, I know I've gone over this in principle. This is a far more detailed dive. If you can't handle that, then this isn't the video for you. By the dictionary definition, omnipotence means Anything is possible, since ultimate power being able to do anything is certainly something Christians preach constantly. However, a Greek philosopher whose name I can never remember and probably won't be able to pronounce once put forward a hypothesis asking such a being to make something he cannot live. This is where the contradiction starts coming in, because surely if he creates something that he cannot lift, then he's not all powerful because he can't lift it. If he can't make something he can't lift, then uh, clearly he's not all powerful. This does bring up a potential for some infinities being greater than other infinities, which is definitely a thing in mathematics. But here's one thing to remember. It sounds impossible. But that is God. The impossible is his stock and trade. As it says in three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke. He just looked at them and said, With man, it is impossible. But not with God. All things are possible with God. That particular was from Mark 10, 27. I'm sure many great thinkers will try and put limitations on God. So they challenge him with this. They would, he wouldn't be allowed to use simple mechanic, lever, to make it possible. But I can imagine this making a, make the rule before the game starts scenario which so many sore losers try to challenge. If, however, we are going to get more technical about it, we can define power in the physics term, which is the amount of energy transferred or converted per unit of time. As time is linked to transcendence, we'll come to that later. But if it's simply how much energy gets moved in any given time, the, omnis the omnipotence loosely means having access to unlimited energy, which is certainly possible. But since unlimited energy does not necessarily mean being able to control it properly, that is far more dangerous. I mean, we could only have unlimited power 
by tapping to say cold fusion or something like that where we're able to produce vast amounts of energy but how are we going to control it in that state we can't really we'll be all powerful but we're not going to do much of it so we're not going to do great deals are we Interesting enough, though, I did something similar to this a while ago. And one thing I was looking up reminded me of that video I did way back in the day. I believe I called that video Most Effective God. If I find it, I'll leave it. I'll leave a link to it in the description. But Ephesians. Chapter 3, verse 20 says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To me, this suggests that God does a lot of his work through us, or at the very least, God has far more power than us, not necessarily the most power in all the universe, therefore making him literally omnipotent, but he knows how to use it in the most practical way. God is a very practical being. Christ himself certainly is, as stated in several of the Gospels. It seems likely, therefore, that making an item that he cannot lift is simply a pointless exercise and something he wouldn't waste time with. It's a bit like saying, yes, I could shoot that rabbit to demonstrate how good my archery is. But are you hungry? Just because you want me to show up my archery skills does not mean I have to shoot that rabbit. Or have to shoot that fly. What is the point? It would just be a demonstration of how pig-headed us humans are. If such an item that God couldn't lift existed, it would stand as a monument to human pig-headedness. When the rest of the living, breathing world is a far greater sign of God's omnipotence. In fact, Job chapter 11 verse 7 says, if you can, can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? He may well have a limit which is a greater limit than we can understand. Just because he can't lift something doesn't mean the making of it isn't a powerful thing. I find omniscience gets downgraded to a depressing amount by practically everyone. The fact that the people say that you only have one potential future, that's the one you're set on, just because God knows everything, therefore he must know your future, therefore free will is impossible. This is a testament to the mindset of putting God in a box, which is ridiculous. The concept of knowing everything is so mind-blowing that I can't explain it here. I've done a video, ironically named God in a Box, that explains this in detail. But to sum the concept up, it's more than just knowing everything possible, knowing the past completely, and knowing what will happen in the future. The moment you factor in free will, the concept of decisions affecting people's lives instantly makes omniscience way bigger, and certainly no laughing matter at all. Just to give a sense of what happens if one little decision 
must be made differently. I recommend watching the Doctor Who episode Turn Left. It's a bit of a head a bit of a head wrangle, but the concept behind it is fascinating. Interestingly, the word omniscience derives from the Latin science. Seus, to know or conscious, with the prefix of omni, meaning all or every. So it can also mean all seeing. This crops up in the Bible on many occasions, that God knows all and has eyes everywhere. As Proverbs 15.3 testifies, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. So even if the bubble limits what God knows, it's to the point that still allows free will. Since people do commit evil things, both biblically and in everyday life, we can't claim God is manipulating us. If so, why is he punishing us? If it's something that we have to do, what we are, then what is the point of us getting punished for it? Whilst in religious circles, omnipresence means that God is everywhere at once, the standard definition, which is synonymous with ubiquity, still has an aspect of interaction, since it, the standard definition is being widespread or constantly encountered. This is interesting because by definition, it's something that we see so often that we forget how significant it actually is, like the internet, electricity, or even mobile phones. We have them on us practically every day, and we don't realise how significant they are. I did a video on that not long ago, when I was getting my first COVID vaccination. Well, the second one, by the way, and also every five. I'll certainly leave a link to that video in the description as well, on bottom of the card. This is so pervasive that pantheism is a fairly common belief even amongst those who don't identify as Christian, or choose to name the earthly, the universal entity. Even some atheists have accepted they would be inclined towards pantheism if they were even theistically inclined. This ties into a nice bit of personal theology for me. Because my grandmother, God rest her soul, believed that if we think of God like an ocean, then we are mere drops in that ocean. This can be a rather special take on the concept of separating the waters of heaven and of earth, similar to how other mythologies gods or greater beings can get divided between the earth and the heavens, but whether or not my grandmother thought this, I'll never know. But the concept is interesting when it applies to pantheistic beliefs. But I must remember it now because she said that when we die we simply become more a part of the ocean of God. Therefore, as I, as I borrow a lyric from a Disney song, even those who are gone are with us as we go on. The Psalms has three separate references to this, such as in chapter 139, verse 7. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? In Colossians chapter 1, verse 17, has this to say also. 
and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. The fact that God holds things together shows that we really do take his presence for granted. Or if we do pay attention to it, we just call it different things. It certainly sounds like he's the force, in terms of Jedi stuff. But, that shows the philosophy is pervasive even in science fiction. At this point, I would like to mention that these things can exist together and in isolation. Just because you can do absolutely anything does not mean you can use it in the best way or be able to see the ramifications of it. There's a great line in the King Killer Chronicle where someone with power can be thoughtless, and that can be far more damaging. Whereas, if you happen to know what you're doing with it, then it is far less damaging. You do need to be benevolent in order to check this. Even just being powerful and benevolent, it is going to be a bit of a toss-up on what you're doing and whether it's correct. From what I've seen, Simon Pegg's film Absolutely Anything is a great example of this notion. If nothing else, it just shows how good a little Scotty Terrier sounds with Robin Williams' voice. Since God can be defined as the standard of goodness that we should aspire towards, only benevolence should be an obvious one, despite what many people think. Yes, Epicurus does bring up the questions about how reality debunks God's benevolence and therefore proves he doesn't exist. This is the balance of his benevolence and his omnipotence. So let's go into this. Is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he's not omnipotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Then whence cometh evil? If he's neither able nor willing, then why call him God? All perfectly good arguments, and certainly ones that would have been potent during the day, but this fails to address an aspect of God that wasn't fully a part of Yahwehism at the time and is most prevalent only in Christianity, certainly from the New Testament times onwards. That's the aspect of God the Father. The only way God can prevent evil in its totality is by controlling everyone, hence removing free will. Since free will is extremely evident in the Bible from Genesis 2 onwards, this immediately rules us out. In ignoring human evil, natural evil like cancers, diseases, and natural disasters are merely a further example of God's fatherly love. How is this the case? Well, the best gift any parent can give their child isn't a house, isn't a car, isn't even a job. It's their independence. The ability to do things by themselves. 
How do we measure maturity or being grown up even? By how much a person is able to do without their parents. Helicopter parenting is never seen as a good thing at any point in time. If a child doesn't experience the hardships of life, then they're going to struggle all the more for the lack of it. In fact, in a strange way, this was the foundation of another religion, just the foundation of Buddhism, because the father of the Buddha, I don't remember his name, it's off my head, he had he had been sheltered all his life, and yet when and when students took him out to experience the world, he saw so much hardship that he just, his mind just blew. He had to go into almost religious seclusion to, to come to terms with it, and that started Buddhism. This is hard to do in the correct amount, but it does make for a better person to walk into the world. Since Buddhism itself is through to peace and in a harmony, this is a pretty strong pretty strong argument for how helicopter parenting is just useless and therefore us experience hardships as young ones. That's the best thing for us. Not ideal by any means, but we still need to experience the world. It's ironically similar to what some people claim the Bible is like compared to modern day thinking. Epicurus wasn't aware of this attribute of God that affected the way we see his relationship with us, and therefore the way he approaches natural evils. This makes very sense since I did the research and Epicurus was born in, in the second century BC since Christ didn't walk the earth until obviously the first few years AD. This clearly shows the after love wasn't hammered home around the time Epicurus was giving out this philosophy. But just because you can't understand or don't have the concept of a loving God or a loving Father doesn't mean that your statements about him are going to be correct. In religion, transcendence refers to the aspect of God's nature and power which is wholly independent from the material universe, beyond all physical laws. Now, this is in contrast with immanence, where God is said to be fully present in the physical world and thus accessible to creatures in various ways. Again, saying a lot like the horse. This can be cited as the reason why we don't see God in the world today, in a very similar way that we don't see the force of gravity or the wind. Balance is as God existing both in heaven and on earth, and therefore can be seen as. An example of him not being human. I've said this before, but as said in the book of Isaiah 55, verse 8 to 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. This may also sound like another way of stating that he is all powerful, all knowing, and the like, but it doesn't diminish. A being like that. One thing that always interests me is no definition of transcendence 
specify what he transcends. This doesn't rule out the possibility that God doesn't just transcend the physical, but potentially the potentially the temporal realm. I know some people have pointed out that it's unlikely God would have made a separate dimension. I don't think that's the right way to look at it. I don't think he responds to time in the same way we do. Since the fact that we're not just going straight forwards in a dimensional space. We can go we can go up, down, left and right as well. We've got all of three-dimensional space to play with, really. Just because God can exist in a slightly higher dimension implies he should be able to move up, down, left, right. He should be able to move around freely through time. We're not going in essentially a one-dimensional direction in a four-dimensional space. Since the second book of Peter, chapter 3, verse 8, says, But do not forget this one thing, dear friend. But the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. This shows God doesn't view time like we do. And I wonder if the impossible things that are possible for God include what we would think of as time travel, or potentially even existing in the same state in different times. Now, I could go into much more of this, but this goes into all manner of fancy and sci-fi speculation. I'm not going to go into that too much. But essentially, and since it's far more than just not being of Earth, it could be being within Earth and a part of Earth across history. And he can move freely along the line and affect things needed. There are many more aspects to God that we could go into, but these are the most commonly understood attributes that are accepted by the wider church. Just because we can't understand how they are possible doesn't immediately discount them and therefore remove the possibility of God. Just because some people in the scientific community don't understand how evolution works doesn't mean it's not possible. Just because I can't understand relativity and time dilation doesn't discount Einstein's theories. Far from it. Furthermore, science has its own seemingly unprovable concepts, such as dark matter and the multiverse. Just because it's a science thing doesn't mean it's automatically right. To add something that cropped up in the video I got the inspiration from, in terms of believability, a horse that just has a horn is far more likely than a creature with a very long neck, which is still short enough that it requires a display at his long legs so he can drink or eat grass. The neck that should clearly eat from the top branches of trees, but yeah, he eats from the lower branches with a tongue that is strong enough to grip and it can sleep standing up. I know it sounds mad, it sounds mythical, and it was considered mythical for many years. But whilst the unicorn is most certainly mythical, hammer leopard exists in the wild and in zoos, though you may call it a giraffe. Ultimately, both me and Rash Anti Rules want sort of the same thing. We both want true equality, regardless of religion or lack thereof. But attempting to prove God does not exist isn't the best way of going about it. God isn't a being we can pin down with ease. The fact we're still struggling to understand humans sometimes shows we may never know what God is really like. That's all the whole point of the history of ideas I'm doing. Because throughout history, religion has had different ideas about what gods would have been like, and therefore, different ideas cropped up. Does just having one religion mean all others are only cropped out? Ricky Gervais does say that technically 
all all these people are practically ninety nine percent atheist. However, what if all religions had part of the truth? If we accept enough of them, we start seeing more of the truth. Just because God is in so many fragments across the world doesn't mean he can't be dis- doesn't mean he can be dismissed. That's why we need to study more. That's why we need to learn more from people. And the more we can find out, the greater our understanding of him will be. That was going to many more videos about this. That was all dropping again and again. But that just shows we just don't understand God yet. We can try. But if we keep trying to dismiss him, he's just not going to work. So remember that, my friends. Stay safe. And God be with you.